Dr. Alex McPherson is now doing well. He could not be here, but he sent me something to read to the community in honor of Bridu X. To my colleagues and friends in the vast Krishnagarh community, it is with great pleasure that I offer this brief testimonial for the distinguished yet always humble Bridu X on the occasion of the symposium. I greatly regret not being able to be there in person and shake Bill's hands and slap him on the back. So I hope these few words will add a mellow note to these happy proceedings. I can think of a few other scientists who have contributed so much and are so deserving of the recognition you are bestowing upon him. He is truly an exceptional scientist, a colleague, and a gentleman. Most of all, he has been a great personal friend for me for almost longer than I can remember. I was first introduced to Bill more than 40 years ago when I was a postdoctoral fellow at MIT and Bill was developing what was to become the finest laboratory in the world in the area of crystallography of steroids at the Medical Foundation of Buffalo. Under his leadership, his group of scientists achieved international renown not only for the structural investigations, but for the methodologies and mathematical approaches they developed. Under Bill's leadership, Medical Foundation of Buffalo Crystallographers, I think it is fair to say, also became the world leading institution and certainly most innovative laboratory in the development of direct methods. Those methods, bold and controversial at that time, have become to dominate the conventional small molecule X-ray crystallography and have in more recent times had a profound impact on macromolecular as well. Bill's active mind did not rest on these successes. However, and in the 1980s, while still maintaining primacy in the mathematical approaches to structure determination, he moved his laboratory in the direction of protein crystallography. As might have been anticipated from the past accomplishments and the intellectual strengths, the group was enormously successful in this field as well. Bill's scientific achievements and his many published contributions in the field of crystallography are distinguished, respected, innovative, and a matter of public record. They need no extensive review here. What may not be so evident and something which must be made very clear is Bill's unmatched contribution to the organization on nurturing both American Crystallographic Association and the international crystallographic community. In my view, Bill is the savior, and that is no exaggeration, of the American Crystallographic Association, and is the most remarkable ambassador to the international crystallographic community that we have ever had. Bill personally took control of faltering ACA, a society with dwindling membership, unattractive to young scientists, and increasingly losing any sense of vision. He completely turned this organization around, gave it a new purpose, new direction, attracted new members, and in the end transformed it into one of the most significant, vital, and active scientific societies in USA. I have never before or since known of anyone to do so much for the scientific community as Bill did for the X-ray crystallography. Finally, it cannot be emphasized enough what an outstanding friend and representative Bill has been to the international body of crystallographers. In my parts of the world, I am convinced Bill Duax means American crystallography. He is admired, respected, and personally liked by probably more scientists in more countries than any other man I know. Just as they restored the ACA to health and vigor, so has he promoted the importance of crystallographic research worldwide. He has put, if you will, a human face on American scientists. I very strongly and with the deep sincerity applaud Bill Duax for this and is honoring him at this conference from a distance Wish him the best in life. He has been an inspiration, an exceptional scientist, colleague, and a very trusted friend of mine. He is rich with honor. Alexander McPherson, Professor Emeritus, University of California.
last speaker of the day is Dr. Anthony Adlagatta, who has been a postdoctoral fellow with Bill. He is going to talk about my experience with Bill and family. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for giving this opportunity to talk about Bill. You know, Bill is very close to the heart and very close to my family. This we have gained a lot, both scientifically and also in the I'll show you how we have done that in this, right? as, a, as a family wise, basically. Okay. So my association with Bill, science and family. So generally, postdoc science is what generally we look at, and then that's the end of it, basically. But I think Bill, and particularly Bill's family, have told them to Karen. I think she's just wonderful lady, basically. And her two daughters. I didn't have a chance to meet your sons, but two daughters. Great opportunity for us to meet, basically. So, yeah. But Bill is always different. I have worked for El Shu, with whom I have worked, but working with Bill is very different. I think uh, all of you have expressed the way he has worked at the international level, but the what, what I'm going to talk about, very small one-to-one -one family to family, small science, and how he could still play, I think, play you know, a role in somebody's life, basically. So we arrived in 2000, basically, after spent, spending one year in Poland, and uh, this is the first picnic what we had. First picnic in Buffalo with Bill, and he is on the Erie Lake. So Bill said, no, this Sunday we are going to have uh, some picnic on the Erie Lake, and he said, yes, we'll go. And then we went there, and then we had the spades ready, bags ready, and then said, let us just fill the bags and put this across the lake, so that, so that you know, we can protect the lake from erosion you know, in the, the coming things. And then, now this is the best way of you know, knowing him personally, that I think Bill. Okay, so how did I enter into Bill's lab? So I am a scientist at the uh, Indian Institute of Chemical Technology, CSR Institute, in this city, in Hyderabad, about 30 kilometers uh, from here across. This is the west side of the city, and we live in the east side of the city, basically. So, so basically, I finished my PhD just about uh, uh, five, six kilometers from here, a little, little, little north from here, basically, in the University of Hyderabad. And 99, and then I traveled across the globe, and then again came back to the same city, but a different institute basically. I wanted to go from here to here, and uh, I'll tell you why I could not go uh, there. So my PhD topic was design synthesis and evaluation of androgen derivatives as aromatase inhibitors. So naturally, uh, so steroids means bill has to be read, and uh, so there was a book that has uh, been published in 1989. So 1993 was not too late. See, nowadays Google is there, so I think you know, one year old is really old. But I think in those days when Google was not there, particularly when you're living so far from US, the four years is still very fresh for us, basically. So I had a chance to uh, get this book chapter from a friend who was already there in US, and had a chance to read his chapter on the steroids, basically. And the steroid transformation analysis, version of sequence structures and determination. So I marked him in yellow on that day, first time when I read it. So I know that there's something important with him. I don't know what it was at the time, basically. So the thesis title was Synthesis and Evaluation of as a Inhibitors, but my finally thesis title ended up this way. Synthesis, crystal structures, and molecular modeling of some two of steroids. There's no aromatase here. That really hurt me in my PhD. I said, I wanted to be a medicinal chemist and start working with molecules that can inhibit the enzyme, but the enzyme was missing there. And uh, I thought, no, I have to really go with a person who actually can teach me steroids and also enzymes, basically. So this is uh, my <laughs> PhD guy. And my uh, I got another guy was Desiraju, was from Angia. Then I went to Buffalo, uh, no, in, in uh, Poland, in Poznan, managed a school scheme, and I gone to Bill, basically. So Bill rejected me in 99. Immediately after finishing my PhD, I asked Bill, so I finished my PhD, and Bill knows that I finished my PhD, and Bill knows him because me because my thesis went to him, and he held it for a very long, long time, basically, <laughs> reading it for a long time, basically. So Bill knows, and he said, no, I'll not offer you a postdoc, because you don't have experience in proteins. He said, my lab, I expect people to be independent, and uh, then I said, okay, then I have to then uh, ask Mariusz. Mariusz also was working in both small molecules, and proteins in Poznan, so I have asked him and uh, he said, no, in this country we don't expect postdocs coming from different countries at the time, 99. Then I said, still I wanted to come, then he told, I'll offer you a salary, 
but that you can still less than what you're in a PhD. And I said, it's not fine. So that paid, that paid me some money uh, to go travel, and my wife also was there. So we all, we both went there and then stayed for one year, and then again applied for uh, Bill, and then next time then he said, okay, now if you to learn something, so come and then work in my lab. So I visited his lab, basically, and when I was traveling from Europe to US, he was traveling from US to Europe. He was a, such a big traveler, I actually did not realize that one, basically. And I also did not know what he meant by independent, because he was never there, basically. He was traveling <laughs> so much, he was traveling so much. And then, at that time, his lab was not many were there in his lab, basically. Actually, only one technician was there, and then I. So when I went to Buffalo, then his two daughters came, actually. And some, for some reason, even Carolyn was not there in the, in the home. So his daughters picked us up both and took, their, to, uh, took us to their home and gave us the first dinner pizza. We never had pizza in our life. And we never liked the pizza basically on the first day. But still, you know, the, the kind of company what his girls have given us and the way that they have described him, we really felt he was crazy. <laughs> the, the way they, the way, he was lovingly describing him, but no, he, he looked very different than many other, many other fathers, basically. Um, so, but anyway, and when I went there, Bill had so many proteins in the lab, and he said that there are proteins out there, just work on that. That's it. He never told me what project it was, what protein it was, basically. So one way what I learned in Marius lab was crystallizing proteins. So then, then I set up a lot of uh, crystallization plates and then went on looking at the microscope. All the time I was there looking at the microscope and uh, got a lot of crystals, basically. And uh, so cholesterol is in two different crystal forms, tryptophanase. And this is a protein that I have identified while purifying another protein, somehow it's purified, purified crystallized that, and several other proteins basically. I don't even know who actually pro provided this protein, but proteins were there, and this protein was born. So we published this paper in you know, ACTA uh, crystallographica in 2003 basically. And it was a very nice experience for me to crystallize proteins basically. So we always had, you know, Bill was there, we always had an opportunity to celebrate. And Bill was always, you know, as People have told that you know, Bill likes to celebrate this, and then he was really good. So here you see this is where our institute is, is a high street, and there is a hospital, Buffalo Hospital, and then there is our this thing. And being very close, just two uh, you know, streets away, is your anchor bar, where the original <laughs> Buffalo Wings is uh, you know, invented, basically. So you know, what, what else can be a blessing for a postdoc, you know, for a girl's <coughs> people, you're always you know, celebrating, basically. So, uh, and now the new institute is here. Now they moved from here to here, basically, in the Lincoln Street. But no, it was very nice. No, there are a lot of occasions for us to go with Bill. Of course, we, as uh, Velo has told, that in house, in house we had several uh, occasions, basically, they don't describe about it. So we had been there you know, with the Vladimir Petnev, David Langs, and Bill. So we had a nice picture of beer, basically, and we and plate full of chicken wings, basically. So this happened several times, and I was there only for two years, but. This is one of the best times. Whenever Bill says, come, let's go for lunch, I didn't get my lunch. And then I know where I'm going, basically. It's always a, a fun to go, a fun to go. And uh, you know, we also had an opportunity to, uh, to have the same fun in San Francisco in the Endocrine Society meeting, basically. So this is my wife, uh, Gayatri. And so as I told you, we have very good acquaintance with his uh, daughters, basically. So they keep on visiting us. And we always had lots of help. We never moved. So first, when we moved, came into Bill's house, we stayed for the night, and then we were put in a hotel, uh, hotel, and they moved us there, and again hotel to another apartment, they moved us there basically, and then whenever we needed some shopping, which we didn't have a car at the time, and Buffalo is very bad for public transport basically. <laughs> Except for Metro, you know, it's very difficult to go around <laughs> Buffalo basically. And they knew that basically, so they said, okay, come, let's go, and then they always used to come, so they used to come along with this, you know, Bill's grandson basically, Julius' uh, uh, son. He just learned walking at the time, and somehow, he found my wife's bangles that made some sound and colorful. You know, it always so they really felt that you know, she made him to walk actually. At least more than what he was walking earlier. Okay, so we had a we had a very fun time in the family basically. So again, you know, uh, Buffalo Medical Center, you know, when you are there, you know, you have to, you know, meet uh, her often basically. So we are very fortunate. But we never thought, you know, sitting in India, studying in India, PhD mm -hmm. students. We never thought that we will share a table with a Nobel laureate for two years. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a great experience and really thanks Bill 
as an of Padil Gain, giving the opportunity to work, uh, to, to uh, chat with him. We talked a lot with the her, her based in the dining hall. And this is probably a unique opportunity for us it, because both husband and wife were there. We had a lot of personal thing to, things to discuss with her. And he used to tell how he has went to directly methods sitting in, in his personal way based so we had great opportunity basically. So, you know, Will also was, you know, he was traveling, he also made him to travel basically. So he also gave me great opportunity for me to learn a lot of uh, epistemic things and gave me an opportunity to go wherever I would like to go, wherever the opportunity for me to take him here has taken me basically. So I have gone to rapid uh, data in Brookhaven, which is very famous and also was very helpful for me to learn. Uh, and synchrotron was an amazing thing for me because I never saw a synchrotron early in my life. And uh, ACA meeting where uh, Bob speech was there, I met Bob there and then he was there and he personally came to see me. And behind me is her popcorn, basically. He's a, a Nobel laureate is presenting a poster behind you. So, you know, what is the, what is the best thing can a poster of the So we shared this, we shared this in our same uh, area where Hub was presenting his poster and I was presenting my poster, basically. It's a blessing for me. Uh, and a lot of other things I have gone there. So, but then I was crystallizing and we published some papers, but again, I was told my Bill wanted to be very independent, basically. And that independence also gave me an opportunity. I was crystallizing only somebody's proteins. And I wanted to do my own protein, basically. And this is one protein. And again, you know, Bill was working on steroid dehydrogenases. And this is one protein at that time, very difficult protein. It was thought. 1970s, people have been working on this protein. And nobody could express this protein in the active form. And nobody could crystallize it, basically. And I never held a pipette in my life by the time, basically. So a person without knowing how to, how to hold a pipette, at least in terms of molecular biology, no, not even knowing what is PCR reaction, wanted to take the challenge of crystallizing a protein in what people have been working for 30 years, basically. And Bill said, okay, go ahead, try it, basically. So, you know, there were a lot of things known about this protein, very important drug target. And uh, so I jumped into that, and then I said, I don't look much, but I only get an experience. That's what I was thinking, basically. So I went ahead. Very fortunately, everything first time worked. Cloning first time worked. Expression first time worked. Purification worked. Removing the tag worked and uh, wonderful protein and set up only three conditions we need now i have a robot in my lab that actually has more than thousand conditions the student set up very new protein comes set up so many conditions to get this crystals basically but i have set up only three conditions the protein challenge for 30 years set up three conditions bought crystal just overnight and thanks to mary erman who was very smart woman actually at the time so i told i got this new protein they said, just set up three conditions because we have a robot. Actually, HWA has this robot for crystallization. They have this 1546 well conditions and it is there. Then she said, first try these conditions. She told me, put saturated sodium chloride, put saturated ammonium sulfate, put saturated PEG. That's it. And I set up these three conditions and just see this crystal basically overnight. And, uh, you know, we have done a lot of biochemistry. But unfortunately, by this time, Bill was losing his money. And I could not stay in the lab to complete this project. So I had to move to uh, Brian Matthews' lab. Again, a wonderful man, basically. I can again give another lecture about Brian. The same, same thing, the wonderful experience I had, basically. So I still continue to work in Brian's lab, but fortunately, it was unfortunately, not fortunately, unfortunately, it was scooped. Because I gave one talk in Endocrine Society meeting about our design, about our construct, protein purification, crystallization. I was excited to share my, uh, share my experience. But that gave them a clue to go back with the 10 postdocs in the lab and could do it in three months, basically. So anyway, but, but this is still close to my heart. One of the things I always tell my students that, you know, this is something that you, know, you should look and you should immediately publish your papers, basically, before you talk about anything, basically. So Buffalo, <laughs> and you can't stop talking about snow. So snow and Niagara Falls, you have to talk about, basically. And uh, Niagara Falls, anyway, there was snow. So basically, and this is the same day I got crystals, basically. Okay, so my 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 learned teacher the crystals. So basically, this is just Christmas season. Buffalo people in Buffalo don't like to celebrate Christmas without snow. <laughs> and this uh, this I was there in yeah, 2000 winter, 2001 winter. I think somebody heard it really right. 2000 yeah, winter, there was a huge yeah. snow just before Christmas. Enough enough snow that people can. And then two thousand. This is on 20. I think 2nd or 23rd December, basically. And we had 96 inches of snow, basically. So they got snow. 
and you can say snow is everywhere. But people just went on. Little bit cleared and went on drive, and nothing has been stopped because of this. So they, you know, it, it is me who was helping people this time. And again, if Bill, again, people have talked a lot about Bill. Actually, I didn't know that you do so much salts. I never knew that basically. That's a secret until now I came to this room basically. But Bill is very good actor, very good singer in fact, very good. And he has this uh, annual uh, acting program uh, in the theater, I forgot actually where, where it was basically. And uh, you know, he uh, asked me to, to be there in 2000 basically. We really enjoyed it. I never knew that Bill was such a great singer basically. <laughs> really, he was wonderful, wonderful. No, now he's a great singer. Yeah, even now, actually yeah. he, came to my lab two days back and he sang for my students. They were very happy to <laughs> him. And came to my home, he sang to my daughters as well. Basically. So they're also very happy. Yeah. So, and again, with the Bill, so in, in, in the Bill's lab, uh, Jim Thomas from Mercer University uh, has visited our lab basically. So he was working for more than a decade on 3 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. He was trying to find the importance of the different residues in the active site, but he doesn't know where the active site is. Mm -hmm. He went on creating several amino acids, published lots of papers, uh, and then once he came to my lab and he was discussing, Bill called me because I was little more uh, aware of computers than Bill, basically. So Bill asked me, okay, this will probably look a little bit better, so I asked him to help yeah. Then we had a chance to sit for just one hour. I developed the model of this enzyme, and he went on telling me amino acids, then immediately I went on putting it, put the substrate here, put the NAD, uh, NAD pH, and then we, and he suddenly we came to know that I am going very far from the active site, and he immediately did the whole biochemistry, whatever, he remembered everything, and then one structure, one modeling could help, help him basically. And, and from there on, he went on publishing another three papers basically. Just for doing one modeling, I got three papers, and thanks Bill again, so he the right person, at JBC, a Journal of Molecular Technology. Molecular Cell and Endocrinology, basically. It's a wonderful experience with Jim. And Jim, when I was in the US, I was there for about nine years. So Jim was trying to get me to Mercer University, actually. Somehow, my mind is always to come back to him. So, but Bill, you know, Jim was, again, another experience to whom, uh, to Bill, I know him, basically. So Bill always evolves. <laughs> so actually, I did not know much about dietary methods, but you know, I knew that he was affiliated with the uh, Hope Hopkins, a lot of papers, but I didn't know really more to basically. So one person starting with the direct methods, computers and those with the computers basically, from direct methods and small molecule structures and protein structures, and finally left everything and again now came back to where the evolution started basically. And uh, I was very fortunate to associate it with Bill. During the time he was translating himself from proteins to uh, the huh? evolution. Bioinformatics. Bio exactly. Yeah. So uh, you know, he, and, I, and again, I had a great opportunity again to work with Bill basically. So this is, you know, I published about three, I published three papers with Bill in that area basically. So we were making about, you know, rational protein mix. And then Bill, when he gave his talk in for the, you know, teaching crystallography, he talked about, you know, glycines basically. Glycines, you know, have a permanent job. For billions of years, glycine held to their job, but no other amino acid than them basically. So here you can see that glycine is always a signature in a lot of, this is a, uh, Rosman uh, fold basically we have Rosman fold here. This is the these are the SDR short chain dehydrogenases. So we have this uh, Rosman fold and then we have substrate binding pocket basically. So we did a nice study based upon the fingerprinting of this and you know, told how the amino acids are conserved in each thing. And then from here he went on to nucleotide sequences basically. Same, same proteins, but I never thought you know we can go and look at what is in the DNA, but he went back to the DNA and everybody starts from you know, reading frame from ATG to the, uh, you know, to, to the end basically. But Bill somehow started looking at, you know, from backside basically in the antisense uh, coding. I never expected that. And then he suddenly discovered a lot of things basically that antisense also how much, you know, uh, that can actually give you clues to evolution basically. I never did that. But anyway, I, he, uh, you know, we together uh, understanding much less, but still published three papers with Bill basically. So, Again, no, we stayed for nine years. Uh, nine years in US, we had our children basically. And when I told Bill that you know, we have a new baby born, our daughter, then Carmen, within you know, less than a month, she's made close to my daughter basically. So for us in US, generally, even the Indian 
uh, postdocs come to uh, US, some parents come to help the uh, new new parents first, but somehow we didn't uh, uh, want anybody to, we didn't want to trouble anybody, but you know, Caroline you know, took pain to you know, send us all these things, and we still so many of them, we have them basically. Our first daughter, we also have second daughter, even second daughter had her first clothing all over this one basically, so <laughs> that's the kind of thing what we have basically, okay? So, and again, I told you, you know, his daughters basically, a lot of association what we have basically. So, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, Julia, the first daughter basically. So she's a very good artist and we had a great chance uh, to work, uh, to, to go and see her uh, studio where she started making this glass beads basically. And she gave us, my wife, some gifts. And those gifts from our daughters also basically. We have those, those things basically. And uh, Sarah, we never saw her dance. She's a very good ballet dancer. We never saw her dance basically. So, but you see, these things actually told us you know, that you know, daughters are you know, good, daughters need to be trained in art basically. So when we came back, my, you know, my daughters again here. So my older daughter, you know, they are learning Indian classical music basically. My older daughter, my second daughter. And Will visited my home two days back. And he had a live performance, but not in the costume, but in the live performance. And Will sitting on the dining table, my daughter is you know, dancing for him. And they really feel, and actually we feel, Bill doesn't feel that I consider him like my father, but I, at least, no, at least he, I feel, because I feel that no, he was definitely a mentor, but more than that for me, basically. So we felt very happy when you visited us, and uh, you had a chance to see my children, basically. And when you had a chance to visit my lab and saw what kind of things I'm doing, I was very happy. And my students also very happy to interact with you. And finally, thank you so much. <laughs> Well, let me first of all thank all the speakers who participated in this and who pledged me and they did an excellent job. I thank every one of them individually. Now, Bill wants to say a few words before we can go. <clears throat> Bill thought he wanted to say a few words, but uh, that was before he saw what was said. Uh, I really appreciate Raul and what you've done. When I was first asked about doing a, something like this, I said, oh, no, no, no. But I'm very thankful that you did. Uh, you've reminded me of a lot of things different people that I didn't remember. Um, and when I spoke with Anthony, I, and it's true, not only was I not around very much, my wife says of me, he was never home. She pretty much raised the four children by herself, and I have the benefit of, of how wonderful they are. Um, I, uh, there have been so many people, and I, many of them are here, uh, especially <laughs> Jenny Glusker, who encouraged me to get in, active in the ACA, and uh, Andre Autier, who allowed me to be the editor of the newsletter. And when we wanted to have issues about countries, uh, Iris Torriani wrote the first issue about crystallography in Latin America, and she was on the ACA Council, and that was a wonderful opening uh, for me to be more involved with Latin America. And when I became President and I wanted to go and visit Argentina, Brazil, Chile. Iris said, you must go to Peru. And she was right. I benefited by going to Peru and met a young student there who went on to, the next time I saw him, he was, he was an undergraduate. And the next time I saw him, he was giving an invited paper at an IUCR meeting. And I hadn't seen him in the interim. But when I went to Peru and saw poverty upon arrival, I questioned, what am I doing here? How can I help these people? There would be much better off to have an engineer or somebody else come to help them. What am I doing? But when I gave a lecture about Nobel laureates, afterwards about 15 young people, high, college and high school age, came up with, with tape recorders to ask me questions about how did I get to do what I'm doing? How could they do that? And then I knew why, why I was there. And so, and I go 
already written in the IUCR newsletter about the most recent move to, to Cameroon, and it truly was a life-changing meeting. I have a black son, I have Ethiopian grandsons, and um, they have changed my children's lives because they are, my white three children have a black brother and there is no prejudice in their lives. I was raised in a small community with extreme prejudice and it was quite shocking to my family when we proposed the adoption of Stephen. <laughs> My father's older sister, there was my father was one of eight children, and the older sister, when we were talking of adopting, wrote a letter to all of her brothers and sisters saying, tell, write to Bill and tell him not to do this. Well, that was good because the brothers and sisters were tired of their older sister telling them what to do, so they decided it was a good idea. <laughs> and that sort of led me to think that that this was gonna be a good thing. It was, I, I was talking about this to, to um, Heather, um, Heather, 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 Heather Baker last night, and she said, well, why did you do it? And I was raised um, in a Catholic education, and the principles that are broadcast uh, suggest you should be charitable. And so when it was, when later I was thinking of marriage, I said, um, Caroline, I think we should adopt children because there are many children that, we, that need to be placed and we don't need to bring new children into a world when there are children that need to be cared for. And she cried and said, we don't want to have children with them. So we had three children and then she got tired of being morning sick all the time and decided that if, if we were going to have a fourth, we ought to adopt the fourth. And so it turned out that you couldn't just we had three children, so there were no white babies available. So the child that needed a home was at that time mixed race. And so we adopted Stephen. I mean, I shouldn't be going into all of this, um, but I can't help myself. Uh, so we had to have a series of interviews, and they asked us, why did you want to have a child? Did you understand what we were doing? And I'm convinced that everybody who is going to have a child ought to have a long series of interviews before they conceive the child. They ought to think about what they're getting into and what it means. Too many people go ahead and have a child and have no idea what they're getting into. So this is our fourth child, but I mean, the kind of questions that they would, of course, ask is, well, what if your daughter, one of your daughters starts going out with a black man and you prepared for that? And then you, so you think about it, so I guess we are. I mean, how else can we do this? And also you learn by traveling a lot and by talking to a lot of people and by being open, that's when you really get an education. You can get one in school, but you get this other education about who people are and what's important, and you learn all the, all the time. So I idealistically thought, this is great, we're gonna adopt this child. I didn't have a black friend, so what am I doing bringing a black child into a home to be raised in a totally white environment without a role model, without anybody. And, and I was clueless, but I thought this was the right thing to do. In the end, it was the right thing to do. It's worked out extremely well. My son, Stephen, and I, he's the only person I can have a totally honest discussion about race with. We've come a long way together. And he still has some surprises for me. I told him this too. We were just on our family vacation. Stephen slowly told me over his life what he was exposed to. Things were happening to him when he was, went to the play, playground for the first time in a white community. Children who had played with him in our home were suddenly calling him names in the playground. And he couldn't come home and tell us. He didn't understand that these were the children of our friends that were in our house and he had to try to figure it out. And so only when he was in his 40s could he tell me. And only last brief about, in May, he told me of all the things that I did wrong. Prior to that, he decided he wouldn't tell me all, that I was a bad parent because I didn't do things right. But now he's told me that. So I think we're just about to the point where we've exchanged all of this information. Um, 
I, I, I now exposed you to, to more than I, I should have, but I think it's important. It's important to me to have people, given the president that I have right now, and given the fact that I have a brother and a sister who would like to have all the Muslims thrown out of the country, uh, it's, even though they have a black nephew, they still are, haven't, it hasn't changed. It's only changed, it's changed the vocabulary. They're careful when they're around him. My mother always loved my black son as much as any other. She was the only one who really understood or cared or could reach out. And I think as to how I came to be who I am and how I am, I think it came through the female line. I think it was my mother, uh, she was reading James Baldwin in secret so that no one would know she was reading it. She was much more uh, open and interested in the world. And that place that was shown on the slide where we grew up, we had, had to start her life in this small town. She had had a couple of years of college. Her father was a dentist. And suddenly she's in a storefront on the main street of, of a town with no curtains in the window. And she has to raise her children there with her husband, my <laughs> my father was an alcoholic, and that was not an easy life. That's why we had to move into this place. And when my son Stephen, in May, tells me that I was not a good grandfather, but his grandfather was wonderful, it was very hard to take. <laughs> and all I could say was, I'm glad that you think of him that way. It's nice that my grand, my son feels that my father, who would take him to the tavern and give him pop, was a good grandfather. I was a bad father because I wasn't encouraging my boys to play football and baseball and all the athletics. Because when I was a kid, my father, who had had offers to play the professional ball with the Cardinals and the Bears, but didn't get to, wanted his children to be the athletes that he hadn't been. So when I'm about six years old, my father takes me out and starts throwing a football at me. So I ducked. Whenever anybody <laughs> throws anything at me, I duck. So I was obviously not going to be a great athlete. And I didn't take my children out and throw things at them. So I was a bad father. Um, I'm going to cut this out now. And I will, uh, you've already been told that I sing. And I, the songs that I sang what, this week, I. Jane Griffin doesn't like it that I sing this Irish, uh, this English barroom ballad. Uh, so I thought I would try to do something a little better, which actually, uh, for the last two years of his life, Herb Hauptman, he had planned that after retirement he would sit down and do uh, work out all those other formulas that he hadn't had time for. And he had all kinds of plans for that. But when the time came, he sat down and was ready, and he couldn't remember formulas. He found he wasn't remembering all of the things that he had known so well, like the back of his hand. And so then he knew trouble was on the way, so he moved into a retirement home area, and Edie was very unhappy. She said, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? But Herb knew that they had to get to somewhere there were, where there would be help. And the last year, uh, he didn't remember much, but he could learn new lyrics to old songs, and he remembered all the old times. So Caroline played the accordion, and the two of us would go out and visit him every two weeks on a Sunday, and we would sing with her the songs that he had sung while he would be hiking through the, the mountains as it turns out in the Washington, D.C. area. And so every time we would sing and have a lovely afternoon, and the last song, Caroline didn't play the accordion, but I always sang Oh, Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling from Glen to Glen and down the mountainside. The summer's gone and all the flowers are dying. Tis you, tis you must go and I must bide. But come ye back when summer's in the meadow, or when the valley's hushed and white with snow, tis I'll be here in sunshine or in snow.
Too much light. <laughs> it's not okay. flash. Okay. Just a second. One more. 